Big names back in action on Airline Drive as the New Orleans Saints begin OTAs, including Michael Thomas and Jameis Winston. What does that mean for your New Orleans Saints? We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into this Wednesday episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks as always for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that we are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube as well. And I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter. You can find me over at USA Today's Saints Wire Tuesdays on Locked On NFL and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked On Saints. Thank you so much for being with us for another episode, whether it's your first time tuning in or whether you've been with us for a while, very, very much appreciate you. If you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing some new graphics, things like that that we're playing around with. Expect some changes over the course of the next little bit, but some exciting things on the way and exciting things on the way in today's episode as well. So we're going to break down what it means to have Michael Thomas and Jameis Winston in the building for OTAs. Yes, these OTAs are voluntary. If they weren't there, it's a big, it's not really that big of a deal, but they are there. And I'll tell you why that is a big deal. Then we'll take a look at why the deep safety role is so important with the New Orleans Saints. We'll break down what happened with Marcus Williams last year, how often he played that role, how he performed, and compare that to Tyra Matthew and Marcus May and what that means for the Saints going into 2022. Then we're going to wrap up with a new face, the New Orleans Saints, moving on from one of their undrafted free agents to bring in one of my big draft crushes a few years ago, second round tight end, Kahale Waring. We've got all of that coming up for you, but I want to start off today with Michael Thomas and Jameis Winston. Michael Thomas in particular, Jameis Winston's been at the facility He's been around the team, not too shocking, not too surprising, not too like big headline to see him at the Saints facility for OTAs. But the return of Michael Thomas has already begun and it could not be any better for the New Orleans Saints. This is fantastic for New Orleans, fantastic for uh, Michael Thomas. I was on Jordi Collada's show on Tuesday morning, the Jordi Collada show, highly recommend you go and check it out. And one of the things that he asked me was, how important is this? for the New Orleans Saints, and sort of where is Michael Thomas mentally in terms of his commitment back to the team? They had all of those issues last offseason. Where is all of this now? And I think if you look at what Michael Thomas has been doing so far this offseason, you look at him cheering on everything in terms of what the New Orleans Saints are doing. He's up there tweeting hashtag who dat, throwing out the Florida Lee. Uh, the Florida Lee uh, Twitter emoji and all that. He also was out there celebrating and uh, rejoicing when the New Orleans Saints drafted Chris Olave, who he's been cheering on along with Joseph Smith and Jigba as well as, uh, or Jackson Smith and Jigba, excuse me, and Garrett Wilson all throughout that 2021 college football season. Then draft day comes, Chris Olave gets drafted, and Michael Thomas is one of the first draft calls calling him up and saying, hey, Let's go work out together in California for 10 days, fly out here. And then so you already started to see all of the buy-in for Michael Thomas. Now, this is the next level. This is the next step, the next sort of piece of the puzzle, him being present for OTAs. Now, not a lot's going to go on during OTAs. These aren't padded practices. We're not going to get clips of him going up and, you know, making these uh, 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 what do you call them? Circus catches over defenders or making contact or anything like that, right? But this is still meaningful nonetheless as the New Orleans Saints are working to get on the same page, learn what Pete Carmichael's version of the offense is going to look like, starting to get the installs, starting to get the playbook, learning a little bit of the new culture, learning a little bit of the new language. You saw CD Deuce today tweet out first practice with the Badger. And then he put out like a caution emergency symbol, like this is the real deal here. So now you imagine that same thing over on the offensive side, seeing all of these vets get involved. So it's great to see Michael Thomas there. And remember, Michael Thomas, Marshawn Lattimore, they have some big time training camp battles that they go up against one another and sort of iron sharpens iron all throughout training camp. This is now the early process of making sure that Michael Thomas is available for camp, making sure he's available for the preseason more or less, right? But more importantly, available for the regular season. So if he's going to be ready to go, this is where those sort of hurdles that Dennis Allen referenced a few weeks ago begin. 
What's he looking like? How's the rehabilitation process gone so far? Is he going to be ready to go out there and uh, at least get some work in maybe later in camp, maybe some light work early in camp? I imagine the New Orleans Saints will be wise. They'll be smart here. They'll take it easy with him going into training camp, not try to overwork, not try to be in any situation till they risk anything. They don't want to risk the progress that they, as well as Michael Thomas, both in terms of the conversation around the recovery, but also the conversation around their relationship. They don't want to risk anything here, I don't imagine. So they will take their time and then work to get him back out there. Most importantly of all, for week one in Atlanta against the Atlanta Falcons, where there's no defense in front of Michael Thomas to stop him. So the work starts now, and Michael Thomas being a part of it, Jameis Winston being a part of it is huge. It also impacts the rest of the team, right? Having Michael Thomas and Jameis Winston there, the guys that are going to sort of be the cornerstones of the offense, the guy who's going to be throwing the passes, the guy who's going to be catching the passes, having both of them there to sort of set the tone in terms of you know, work ethic and workflow and communication and language. And, you know, um, Chris Olave already leading by example, or excuse me, Michael Thomas already leading by example for Chris Olave. When Chris Olave talked about it during rookie minis that watching Michael Thomas wanted, you know, made him want to be a better competitor, right? And all these other pieces. So now that's where that ends up permeating and impacting the rest of the offense. And in many ways, the rest of the team, because as the offense gets better and better, better. The defense gets better and better, better. That makes the offense better, which makes the defense better. And then it's this really, really nice cyclical situation that you want to try to create. So having Michael Thomas back in the building this early for OTAs, not to say that he's fully recovered or anything like that, but as a part of his process to have him already back in the building and in the facility on Metairie or in Metairie, excuse me, on airline drive, huge, huge, huge W for the New Orleans Saints. Coming up next, we're going to talk a little bit about what it is that gets the New Orleans Saints their W's over on the defensive side. And a lot of times it's the play of the deep middle of the field safety. We're going to talk about what that means and we're going to break down why it's important to the New Orleans Saints and how the two safeties in the room now will be able to fill in for a big, big, big loss in safety Marcus Williams. We got all that coming up for you as you continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. But first, I get to tell you about Athletic Greens. Their AG1 powder is an absolute daily staple for me. Have it every morning right before I have my cup of coffee as my I'm a pour over guy. So while the water is brewing, I make this. It's one scoop of AG1 and in about a cup of water. Shake it up. Comes with a nice little um, uh, tumbler that they give you, a nice little water bottle that they give you. Shake it up and then you just drink it. And it doesn't taste bad. It's not one of those situations where you're trying to like choke down multivitamins, big uncomfortable pills or gross tasting supplements and stuff like that. No, this basically kind of tastes a little bit like bubble gum. Like it's got a little bit of a sweetness to it. It's really, really easy to get down and it's huge. I mean, it helps with gut health. It helps with making you stay more awake at night, helps you or not at night, but like throughout the day, but then helps you sleep easier at night because you're not carrying around a bunch of undigested food or you're not dealing with gastrointestinal issues because this makes it easier for you to be able to digest food throughout the day. So I want you to go and check this out because this is not just like some product that's fun to have and that's delicious or anything like that. This is a really, really helpful product. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NFL network. That is athleticgreens.com slash NFL network to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks as always, making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out our Locked on Sports Today podcast. All the biggest stories around the sporting world in less than 20 minutes. It's a fantastic podcast, super fun. Also comes with today's take, which gives you one of the best takes from around the entire Locked on Podcast Network all hosted by the great Peter Bukowski as well. So you can check that out on the Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcasts, and on YouTube as well. All right, the deep safety role. One of the biggest losses that the New Orleans Saints took on this off season, outside of maybe head coach Sean Payton, and you can maybe make the argument between this loss and, of course, Teron Armstead, but was Marcus Williams, right? And losing Marcus Williams, who was your one of the cornerstones of your defense, he was the deep safety. And we talk about that all the time. And I know I, I'm guilty of it, right? I say that all the time. 
He's the deep safety. He's the single high guy. He's the center fielder. But what does that really mean? And why is that even important? So let's actually break this down as opposed to me just like throwing a bunch of buzzwords at you. (laughs) And this is what I love, right? Wednesday, this is what we do. We break things down. We get to the fundamentals, midweek fundamentals. Let's get it. So when we look at the role of the deep safety, basically there's two ways that safeties play in the NFL. And there's two sort of quick monikers to remember. Middle of field open middle of field, closed. Those are the two phrases that you need to know. MOFO, and and I can't say the other one, but you get it, MOFC, you get it. So you get both of those. And basically the idea with that is that when you talk about middle of field open, you're usually talking about an even number of defenders taking deep zones. That can be two things. That can be cover two, which would have basically two safeties or two deep DBs that are guarding one half of the field each, right? Or you can get into situations where you're talking about like quarters, for instance, or cover four, where you have four deep DBs, each taking a quarter of the field, right? One each at the hash and then one each on the outside of the hash. Just a for instance there. The other role is middle of field close. Now, obviously there are some things in between that, right? There's these inverted things, there's you know inverted defenses, there's cover sixes, there, there's things like that to where it's like a mix where it's cover three on one side, cover two on the other side or cover four on the other side, cover two on the other side. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Don't worry about all that, right? This is the basics, right? The fundamentals. So that's middle of field open. Middle of field close means usually that there is some primary defender up deep in the middle of the field. That can be cover one, which means one deep safety with man coverage everywhere else, or cover three, which would be one deep safety and usually two bailing or uh, cornerbacks that run away from the line of scrimmage and then take the other thirds of the field while a safety mans the middle of the field. And then usually another safety will come down and play in the box, maybe a little bit of a robber role to where they're playing underneath zone, things like that. So there's a couple different places or they can go and take the flat, stuff like that, or they could be manned up. It, it all depends, right? There's a lot of different things that you can do. So the, the primary role of that deep safety, when we talk about the center fielder is in cover one and cover three. Those are usually the ones that we talk about. Now the New Orleans Saints run cover one and cover three a lot. They mix in a lot of cover four last year, played a bunch of it, and they were really good in it as well. But cover one, cover three is sort of a primary primary defense, not only for the New Orleans Saints, but also in the NFL. It matches up well against most 11 personnel schemes and things like that. It allows you to be able to have the versatility that you need to be able to press uh, coverage at the line of scrimmage, all that, particularly in cover one. So that's why the deep safety is so important, because it's such a staple look for defenses, in particular, Dennis Allen's defense. And the thing that's really nice about it is that when you have guys that can disguise, you can start off with two safeties pre-snap looking like they're going to take deep, but then one of those safeties could roll down into the box while the other safety moves to take the deeper uh, zone, which is one of the reasons why he talks about holding disguises longer now with Tyron Matthew and Marcus May, because both of those guys can play turning their back to the quarterback and, and sprinting to make a play on the ball or coming downhill to make a play down in the box or down in the short area, short to intermediate area of the field. So that's why having those two guys become so important. So let's compare those two guys to Marcus Williams who they lost over the course of the offseason. So I went through and I took a look at Marcus Williams played 755 snaps as a deep middle of field safety. Some of those are cover one, some of those are cover three, some of those we'll call miscellaneous. Um, that's 72% of his snaps. That is a huge workload that he took on by himself. During that time, over those course of the 755 snaps, here's why I talk about Marcus Williams being a great safety because of the things that you don't see, right? Always talk about, hey, broadcast you kind of robs him of what he does well. 755 snaps as a middle of field safety, right? One of the most dangerous parts of the field where you can give anything and everything up. Targeted 14 times and allowed six catches for 96 yards and a touchdown. 755 snaps. Now, some of those were also run plays during that time, but the majority of those were pass plays and targeted 14 times. Pretty incredible stuff. Five pass breakups, including an interception on those targets as well. Now, here's where we can kind of start to break things down a little bit. Where are these snaps most important? When out of those 755 snaps that he took as a deep middle of field safety, 64% 64% of them happen when they're, when the opposing offense had 7 to 10 yards to go to pick up a first down. So that probably means early downs. And that is also replicated or demonstrated in the fact that those middle of field safety snaps dropped going from first down to second down to third down. 
first down was a larger percentage of those snaps. Second down was a smaller percentage. Third down was a smaller percentage than that. That be that would be because Dennis Allen loves to man up in on third down situations because he likes to send those blitzers. And then also you might want more safeties back if it's third and long, things like that. So the next piece of this is that 78% of those snaps came in between the 20s. That makes sense, right? You don't see a lot of, there's not really a lot of opportunity for deep middle of field safety play in the red zone, for instance. And when they're, when opposing offenses are pinned against their own end zone, they're usually going to put two safeties back there and then try to get the blitz going, right? Or man up and try to get the blitz going. And then finally, the majority of the time, more than 60% of the time, there was one or no cornerback playing press coverage on those snaps. That's pretty remarkable because that means that they were allowed to give free releases off the line of scrimmage knowing that uh, Marcus Williams had their back. That's trust, and that's a pretty, pretty big deal. Tyra Matthew, 607 plays as a middle of field safety, some cover one, some cover three, some miscellaneous. That's 53% of his snaps in 2021. 21 targets, 11 catches, 108 yards allowed, only one touchdown as well. Two pass breakups, no interceptions. Modest stat line there. Um, Everything in terms of the additional breakdown that we did was the exact same, right? In terms of like uh, the majority of those snaps coming with seven to 10 yards to go for a first down. The majority of those snaps coming on first down. The majority of those snaps coming uh, on snaps in between the 20s. The one big difference was that when Tyron Matthew played a deep safety role for the Kansas City Chiefs in 2021, over 60% of the time, there was either one or two press corners though in the majority of snaps. Keep that in mind because when you look at Marcus May, and I'm going to go back to 2020 and Marcus May because 2020 wasn't his best season. He didn't have a lot of snaps, but it's the most recent season that we can go to to where he played a primarily deep safety role. 481 plays as a deep middle of field safety. That's 43% of the time. 13 targets, four catches allowed. Really good there. Only 65 yards allowed, no touchdowns. Uh, Four pass breakups on those, no interceptions on those, but he did have two interceptions in that season. Uh, 69, a very nice percentage there, of the time. Zero press corners. That's more akin to what Marcus Williams looked like. So you want to talk about which one of these guys should be able to fit into Marcus Williams' shoes most immediately? It's Marcus May. And if you look at the plays that Marcus May made over the course of those 481 snaps, and trust me, believe me, I did. I also looked at the 607 snaps that Tyron Matthew played because I'm a nerd. Um, Marcus May made a, a variety of plays that forced him to either turn his back to the quarterback, sprint and make a play downfield, right? Track a ball, make a play downfield, move laterally and, make, laterally and make a play in the intermediate area, or push up and make a play in the short to intermediate area. So a lot of versatility in terms of his ability to be able to affect plays. For the most part, Tyra Matthew made his plays coming downhill and coming down into the short and intermediate area, which is why I believe that Tyron Matthew is a better fit in that strong safety Malcolm Jenkins type role, while Marcus May is a better fit in the deep safety Marcus Williams role. So that's what I would expect to see, but they're each going to be interchangeable and they're going to do a little bit of both jobs, right? They're both going to play in the box. Marcus May can do that. They're both going to play that deep safety. As you can see, Tyron Matthew can do that. But I think the primary roles will very likely be Matthew playing in the box or coming down into the box and Marcus May playing deep. That's why it's important. That's why losing Marcus Williams was such a big deal, but that's how the New Orleans Saints are going to be able to fill that role in 2022. Coming up next, the New Orleans Saints have a new face in the building, and he was one of my big draft crushes a couple years ago, tight end Kahali Waring, back with an NFL team now in the Big Easy. Could he contend to get a role, right, a spot on the roster at tight end? and maybe even a larger role than anticipated. We'll break that down as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. But before we get to that, do y'all remember a few weeks ago we did our projections for Chris Olave by looking over the last few, uh, last six or seven years of wide receivers drafted in the first round, and we came up with a 56-catch, 754-yard, five-touchdown season? Well, our friends over at Bet Online now have odds when it comes to Chris Olave's rookie season. And check this out. The over under for Chris Olave's receiving yards, 750 and a half yards over under and touchdowns, four and a half touchdowns over under. So if you liked my projection of 754 yards and five touchdowns, you're taking the over on both of those. You can go and check that out over at bet online. Or if you want to be a little bit more conservative now that they signed Jarvis Landry, you could pull back, take the under as well. They've also got 
uh, uh, Drake London's receiving yards and touchdowns, Traylon Burks receiving yards and touchdowns. You can look at rookie quarterbacks. There's a ton of stuff now that you have a rookie draft class to take a look at in terms of player performance props over at Bet Online. And there's a ton more too around the NFL, around the NBA with the NBA playoffs ongoing with the Eastern and Western Conference Finals continuing on. And of course, MLB, boxing, esports, and much more. So go check them out today, whether you're visiting on your desktop or your mobile device, you're going to be able to get in on all the trends and action over at Bet Online, where the game starts. Let's get it. Huda Nation wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Once again, don't forget that we are here with you every single Monday through Friday with brand new episodes all off season and into the regular season as well. So make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube as well. Drop a comment, leave a thumbs up, all that good stuff. See on the scroller down here, comment with your favorite all-time saint below if you're watching on YouTube. That is for you. Uh, and everybody that's listening, you can send that to me on Twitter, at Ross Jackson Nola, because that's going to be a, a later talking point uh, later on in the offseason. Right now, though, I want to talk a little bit about Kahale Waring. Waring? Kahale Waring. Coming through, uh, signed by the New Orleans Saints, who move on from one of their undrafted free agents, a defensive back out of uh, out of Iowa that they moved on from making a roster spot for him. But can Waring be someone that actually ends up being maybe one of those sneaky signings that sees some play in 2022? Now, this is a guy that I was really, really high on when he was coming out of the draft. Uh, I really liked him. And one of the things that I got super excited about him about was how athletic he is. So at six foot five, 252 pounds, this guy had a 9.40 RAS score. So you're already seeing that this is like the perfect mold of player for the New Orleans Saints, right? Six foot five, 252 pounds, exactly what they like in terms of size at tight end. Four, six, seven speed, good speed, 36 and a half inch vertical jump, 10 foot, two inch broad jump. And he also had some good shuttle times as well. So what you're seeing there is explosion, speed, and size. That's exactly what you want in a modern day tight end. Now, what is it that the New Orleans Saints lack at the tight end position right now? Right now at this moment. Pass catching, right? Adam Troutman, Nick Vanette, good blockers. Adam Troutman took a step back last year as a blocker. I'm sure he'll get back to that. But we don't know if he's really going to develop as a pass catcher. Why wait, right? Better to have two pass catching tight ends than no pass catching tight ends. Your best pass catching tight end is probably Jawan Johnson, who played the position for the first time in his entire life last year. And then Taysom Hill, but you don't know if he's going to be available at the beginning of the season with the Liz Frank injury and all that. So right now, there's a big question mark in terms of pass catching tight end. Lucas Kroll, again, I'll tell you to keep an eye out on him. He's also big. He's also athletic. He fits the size. He has the speed. He has the explosion. He's an undrafted free agent coming into this year's NFL undrafted free agent class coming out of Pitt. Played with Kenny Pickett last year. So... He's also somebody that could hold that throne as the un, uh, you know, uh, the, the guy that's not being paid enough attention to surprise camp pass catcher. He could absolutely be that guy. But I'll tell you what, the New Orleans Saints value, they value NFL experience. And um, Waring, Waring has been in the NFL since 2020, came in as a draft pick at the Houston Texans, uh, spent some time as well with Buffalo and the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars as well, most recently. Uh, he was a third round selection. Sorry, I think I said second round selection earlier. Third round selection, top 100 selection, 86 overall. He's only got three career catches though in the NFL, targeted only seven times. And he ends up putting up uh, with that, what, 35 yards and two first downs. So that's what you're getting from him from the NFL side. From the college side though, you saw a little bit more from him going into his San Diego State alum uh, in his final year there, 31 receptions for 372 yards, averaged 12 yards per reception for three touchdowns. Those aren't humongous numbers, but you watch this guy and what he has the ability to do. He's a good blocker. He operates extremely well in those Y leak tight end uh, play action plays that the NFL loves so much. He can attack the seam. He runs some in routes. He can attack the middle of the field. He is really, really good hands catcher. Tough to knock the ball out of his hand, doesn't drop the ball very much. He'll fight through contact. He'll fight to make contested catches, all of that. So you're looking at one of those late free agency signings, not like a Tyron Matthew and Jarvis Landry late free agency signing, right? This is like a, remember when the Saints signed Manti Teo in like June and then he turned into a starter for them and he was actually like a bright spot of those defenses, which is to say something I understand those defenses were different those days, but 
he was still very much a bright spot as a good run stopper. And then that went on, right, as the New Orleans Saints defense continued to get better. This could be one of those signings for the New Orleans Saints. And I don't usually get high on these types of signings in May, June. I usually kind of say, okay, well, there'll be camp bodies in it. If they surprise, they surprise. But Kahali Waring is one that I'm actually excited to see hit the field. I'm really, really excited to see this kid hit the field because he had a lot going for him in that 2020 draft you know, evaluation process. It's one of the reasons why he went in the third round as a tight end, top 100, all of that. He's somebody that has a lot of potential. Maybe he just didn't realize it with the Houston Texans or with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Who could blame them? The Buffalo Bills last year had a lot of different weapons around, and he was kind of buried behind uh, Dawson Knox and some of the other guys there, which is why he ended up with a different team by the end of the season. All of that. So for the New Orleans Saints, who are still looking for that pass catcher at tight end, maybe going out and grabbing the established veteran is one option, right? I've talked about Kyle Rudolph before. But also maybe grabbing the young guy that hasn't caught on yet that could easily fit into the New Orleans Saints scheme as a seam stretcher, as somebody that can run those Y League pass uh, play action uh, 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 schemes, excuse me, uh, and plays, or somebody that can attack the middle of the field. Maybe going out and grabbing that guy that's got a high ceiling is just as valuable just to see what happens during training camp. If it doesn't work out, no harm done. This is not going to be a contract that's like a three-year deal that's worth $6 million or anything like that, or $6 million per year or anything like that. Like This is probably going to be a vet minimum contract, right? That's not even going to hit the books because it won't scratch the top 51 of the 90-man roster. That's very likely what's going to be the case. And I think that this is a smart move by the New Orleans Saints. Now, unfortunately, the Saints still kind of need to figure out what's going on with running back. They tried to sign Sony Michelle. That didn't work out. He went to Miami. They didn't, it, it doesn't seem that Daryl Williams was actually visiting the Saints when he was in New Orleans. Seems like he might've just been visiting home. He's now signed with the Arizona Cardinals. So running back is still one of those positions that makes a lot of sense for the Saints to continue to look at as well as linebacker, but tight end. That's still one that a lot of people have question marks about. So great to see the Saints addressing it, getting a look at a young player that could turn out to be a bit of a surprise in Kahale wearing. All right, y'all, coming up in tomorrow's episode, let's project for Thursday the offensive starting lineup for the New Orleans Saints as OTAs begin, which began on uh, Tuesday, and of course, as we roll into training camp in a couple of months. We'll certainly update this. We'll go offense on Thursday. We'll go defense on Friday. You got any hot takes? You got anybody that you think might end up starting over somebody else? I got one for you. And yeah, it's on the offensive line. So we'll break that down. But if you've got one for me, hit me up on Twitter at Ross Jackson, Nola, or drop it in the YouTube comments below, along with your favorite saint of all time. Would also love to know that. All right, y'all. I appreciate you as always. Make a Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out for your second listen, Locked On NFL, all the news you need around the league in less than 30 minutes with a wacky band of characters, including myself, Luke Braun, uh, Tony Wiggins, James Rapine. Uh, uh, Tyler Rowland. There's a ton of us, right? It's a ton of fun. So make sure you come through and get all the news you need around the league. Less than 30 minutes with Locked On NFL Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube as well. I appreciate you as always making me a part of your day, making me a part of your routine, and I will see you tomorrow for everything you need in between these episodes on your New Orleans Saints. Make sure you're following along on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.